It's now time for On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson. The conversation will range from local dialogue to international. This show is meant to enlighten, inform, and to inspire. On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson begins now. Hello and welcome to On the Line. My name is Cheryl Wilkerson. Glad to be with you. It is another Sunday afternoon. I'm in my favorite place with you all on a Sunday afternoon. And so I am very, very excited about the show today. I tell you that every Sunday, but every Sunday it's the truth because I just love my job. I get to sit here and I talk to people and I learn things and I get to share it with you. Nobody could ask for anything more than that. So today, check this out. Get your juice, get your tea, get whatever, because you are going to be spellbound today. You're not going to want to leave this radio. And then you're going to be asking me, how soon is this going to be up on the internet? Because that's the kind of show we're going to have today. Imagine a little girl and she decides to go to school. As a matter of fact, she says, you know what? I am going to go and I'm going to go learn electrical engineering from Duke University. And I'm going to get a certificate in African and African American studies. And then after that, you know what? I think, you know, I'm going to get my BSc in uh, biomedical and, like I said, electrical engineering. And I'm going to get a PhD. And that's going to come from John Hopkins. And that's going to be in biomedical engineering as well. And then after that, I'm going to go out and conquer the world. How am I going to do that? Well, I've got this insane interest in STEM. And that's what's going to take me all over. And that's how I'm going to spread my gifts. And that's exactly what she does. Ten years of experience in nonprofit executive leadership roles. How about that? How about being the director of the STEM Innovation Learning Center at Wayne State University in Detroit? How about in 2015, founding STEMANISTA Project? Yes, it's a groundbreaking national initiative, and it inspires middle school girls to consider tools and careers in STEM. And then along the way, you know what? I think I'll take a tenure as president and CEO of the Michigan Science Center and while I'm there, yes, I'm named the most influential woman in Michigan. And in 2017, yes, I'm honored by Trailblazer by Career Mastered Magazine. Also a member of the National Academy of Science Board on Science Education, appointed by Democratic and Republican administrations. Y'all know that's a feat right there. And yes, I do a little published poetry. What do you mean, Cheryl? Well, yeah, some of my poetry, it's included in the 100 Best African American Poems, edited by Nikki Giovanni. And my most recent work, Cheryl, it's entitled How Weaving Came Into the World. And it was just published this past January. And yeah, I forgot to tell you, I have been recently honored as one of the top 2021 Top 50 Most Influential Leaders by Charleston Business Magazine. That is who you are meeting today. We are welcoming to On the Line, Dr. Tanya Matthews. Welcome, Dr. Tanya. How are you? I am good. So good. Sister Cheryl, you make me love my parents right now. Oh, my God. (laughs) They must have been pulling their hair out all along that journey. My father asked me more than once, what exactly did I pay for? (laughs) So, so, so yes, but for all the parents and the, and the students and the faculty out there, you know, I, I feel your pain. It will be all right. He said, <laughs> what did I right. pay for? That is hilarious. <laughs> well, Dr. Yes. Tanya Matthews is now. She joined the International African American Museum in April of 2021. She is now the president and CEO of this museum. I am so excited about this museum, in case you all don't know. And I was bound and determined that the audience was going to learn all about this museum today. So welcome to On the Line. Yes. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. <laughs> so all along, I, I read, uh, you know, I do news or whatever. So I read a lot. So all in the last few years, I'm always seeing this company and that company. Everybody's always mm-hmm. donating to the museum. And I'm like, this thing is going to be a monster. And a couple of mm-hmm. weeks ago, mm-hmm. I saw where instead of opening at the end of 2023, the museum is now opening at the beginning of 2023. 
Oh my goodness. Can I get in? No, let me stop. Okay. So the international tricks for you. The International African American Museum located in Charleston, South Carolina, and you are in fact the president and CEO. Welcome to the yes. show again once again. Tell us yes. about this museum. So from what I understand, it was birthed mm-hmm. over twenty years ago. Yes, over 20 years ago, 22 years ago, actually, um, the first sort of public conversation about bringing this museum uh, to life was in a State of the City address uh, given by a former Charleston mayor, um, Joseph P. Riley. Uh, He said in 2000, uh, in his State of the City address, that the the city of Charleston needed to have a museum uh, like this. He had just uh, sort of been reading and read a book in particular called uh, Slaves in the Family uh, and was just kind of blown away um, by what he did not know about the experiences and the history uh, and the stories that his African-American neighbors were carrying, right? Um, and so that is that is where that began. Um, and it's, it's taken obviously quite, quite some time, you know, for a couple of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we are a $100 million capital project. Um, we are built from scratch. We uh, we did not um, have uh, the scaffolding of a building. The second thing is um, Charleston is rife with history. For all of my historians, public historians, history buffs or podcast history lovers, you know, all roads lead back to Charleston, mm-hmm. especially when you're talking about African-American history and some of the roots of the challenges around equity that we're dealing with today. So there is no shortage of, you know, historic sites and, and places and spaces. So we had to get just the right um, spot. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit uh, later. I'm sure you'll ask questions on that. Um, and then, you know, things things move. You know, things, things move uh, slowly in those ways. I mean, getting money is one thing. Mm-hmm. Finding a location is another thing. But creating the, the community and political will to do something like this is is its own thing as well, uh, and so all of those things have been happening together um, for for more than uh, twenty years. Uh, and I have been um, blessedly humbled uh, to come in just a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, and help sort of bring this project um, over over this first milestone. Uh, building the building is less than half the battle uh, mm-hmm. and now we are we're just about ready to uh, to open our doors and and begin our work mm-hmm. what made you feel compelled to be on board with this project you know it's such an interesting question and i try to think of a way to to answer that but can you imagine i mean you're sitting you're doing doing what you do and you get this this phone call that says you know hello uh, your name has been suggested uh, as a solid candidate for the president and CEO of the International African American Museum. Mm. Uh, say, say what now? Say, mm. I'm, I'm sorry, mm. where? And so, you know, that the call itself, I think, was was powerful uh, in in that. Um, and I had been, um, you know, somewhat familiar with with the project, you know, from a distance because I've been in museums and I had I had led museums before um, and I was I was I was stunned and the more I learned about the museum and, and the scale um, uh, and also I immediately began thinking about you know what we could do so you know I got this call um, the, the process began towards the end of, of 2020 yeah I remember 2020 yes uh, <laughs> that is that is recent history and so with, with everything you know we were all in that Space, trying to figure out, okay, you know, the, the world is happening right now. History is happening. We're having some incredibly powerful conversations. What am I going to do? What, what What is our play going to be? And to get the call about um, the possibility of leading the International African American Museum, sort of in the wake of all everything that's happening in in 2020, was um, an unbelievable opportunity. But um, as, as I sit here, almost an unbelievable, I think, perhaps calling or or preparation. Mm-hmm. I mean, as you sort of detailed in, in the bio, you know, I've spent time in museums and in formal education, but a lot of it has been on on the STEM uh, side. And, and But all of that still included community building. 
um, I had been doing a lot, a lot of work around really rigorous and pointed conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion within that STEM space, right? You know, we're, we're still on yeah. that journey in that space. And, and so, you know, and that was just sort of the, a, a microcosm of these, these larger conversations. Um, and so, you know, I had been in that space. And so as, as I stepped in, into this role, I realized, oh, is that why I had that experience back in uh, 1998? Mm-hmm. Oh, is that 2012 finally mm-hmm. becoming worth the headache? Mm-hmm. You know, so, so all of this is, is starting to, to come together. And I have um, sort of a kind of like a phrase that I use to um, encourage uh, folks as they're thinking about stepping into this space uh, with me. And they're curious, how does an engineer sort of end up kind of in this space? Well, one, engineers can do anything they want to, but that's, mm-hmm, a, that's a different mm-hmm, interview. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like to say that the two scariest words in the English language are racism and algebra. And I happen to do both. Oh, my okay? God. <laughs> but, I mean, but, but think about it. When you, when you say algebra, folks cringe. And they say, well, you know, that's for those people. That's for that kind of person. Like, I didn't have any experience with that. I had a bad experience with that. I don't know. Oh, my God. My kid is going through that now. What am I going to do? I'm not prepared to help them through that. The exact same thing happens on racism. Well, you know, I don't know anything about that. That's not my conversation. How do I step in? I had a bad experience with that. Now my kid is going through that. What do I do? So it's been very, very interesting um, to realize that, that a lot of the, the, the ways we've gotten people into those conversations, the way we've prepared folks uh, for, for that conversation and uh, real talk. You got to know your your addition and your subtraction in order to get to your algebra. Mm-hmm. And you got to mm-hmm. know your history and your facts to get to these conversations about equity and inclusion and, and what's happening, um, you know, when we talk about these racial conversations today. And so it's been kind of funny uh, in a not so ha ha way right. about how those, those skill sets have, have come together um, and how we're approaching things at the museum. That's true about that racism and that algebra. That's so true. That's mm-hmm. so true. Matt, Matt I, I cried every night. My mother was a teacher. I cried See? every night behind <laughs> math until I got to Norfolk State University. And for some reason, the light bulb came on. But yeah, and today I'm mm-hmm. still intimidated by math. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So why is this museum... The International African American Museum, why is it important to the entire nation? Is it just yeah. important to, you know, people whose ancestors might have been here, or is it just important to black people? Why is it important to the entire nation? It is definitely important to the nation, and I think that there perhaps was a time when we could have uh, diluted ourselves into thinking that this is just a story for some, but clearly with whatever is happening today and the conversations that we're having in every household, in every space, it's clear uh, this is an all in uh, con- kind of conversation. Um, and the International African American Museum being placed in Charleston on uh, the, the waterfront is no accident. Um, we're being built at the site of Gadsden's Wharf. Um, which historians will tell you is one of our nation's most prolific uh, international slave trading. Yeah. Um, that's the that's the site. Um, depending on the context and the historian, um, somewhere between forty five and fifty five percent is the estimate of how many of the enslaved Africans that ever came to America came through this very spot. And so that that is the power of the space uh, and the and the place that that we're in. And we're, we're taking the, the space of honoring um, the untold stories of the African-American journey in its entirety, right? So I get the question a lot. Y'all going to tell the truth down there? You know, I know mm-hmm. where you are. You going to tell the truth? Uh, yes, we're, we're going to tell the truth. And we're going to tell the whole truth, the whole story. One of the things I like to emphasize is that this, this period of slavery is important. It's critical. It has been defining for the African-American journey, but it is not the beginning and it is not the end. It is flat in the middle. Um, And so as the International African-American Museum, one of our international leads is indeed the way we discuss the origin story, right? So we talk about communities um, in in Africa um, 
and the cultures uh, that we that we came from and what we brought. Then we also talked a bit about the African diaspora. We talk about how we were dispersed mm -hmm. um, and, and some of those differences. And we're trying to make relationships uh, with the um, fellow institutions and communities so we can keep that story alive. And then, of course, we talk about um, this really seminal and critical period of slavery, um, not just from the perspective of brutality of, of slavery, but from the perspective of the brutality and the inhumanity of slavery, and also from the perspective of the humanity of the individuals, including their genius and technology that they, that they brought, and also in terms of sort of the echoes. Um, of, of that as we sort of moved, uh, moved forward. So when we get to, to talking about, say, modern American history, when we're talking about uh, everything from the civil rights movement to the jazz age to modern conversations, imagine watching, you know, a hero movie, but you don't get to see the beginning of the movie, so you don't know how hard they mm -hmm. had to work to get to whatever superpower they end up with at the end. And so it's actually important to understand the full context to really get a sense of what the African American journey is bringing to um, this large uh, national uh, conversation, um, and whenever we we can, um, we we throw in a little Carolina lens. That's what I call it. I call it a Carolina lens, and we we talk about um, national stories, um, and we reveal um, a you know sort of the African American story behind it, but also perhaps the Carolina story behind it. So, for example. Um, I think many of us are familiar, at least I hope folks are familiar with, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, right? This is the seminal. Hopefully so, yes. Uh, right, uh, listen, we got to hope, right? Yes. <laughs> this is the, the seminal case uh, that, that led to the desegregation of public schools in, in America. And for those who have sort of gotten into it, they realize that the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall, had a strategy, right? They were building Five case by case by case. Yes, right? yes, yes. It's, it's not a single, I mean, you know, because by the time something is going to the Supreme Court, this is the way we're all framing it, you know, that single case that's, that's at the top. But a lot of times those strategies work to build precedents, get stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, one of the seminal cases in that precedent building strategy became the case in North Carolina that was ultimately decided by a judge by the name of Judge Waring. He was the federal judge. You, you got a series of cases, local district mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. He was, um, that was the case that had a federal um, decision attached uh, to it, which is a requirement, you know, to get up to uh, the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. And a lot of the Supreme Court's um, written, uh, written opinion actually was lifted from that case. It, it was so important, so so critical, so seminal, and so we we throw that that lens on it. And a very interesting and strategic decision was made. So then, you know, well, if it was so important, why put you know Brown first? Why not? Why not put the South Carolina? Mm -hmm. um, why, why use the Topeka, Kansas? Case? Right, right, yes. <clears throat> and part of it was to help the country understand that this wasn't just an issue in the South, and that if a Southern State, if a deep southern state led the case, then there was the chance that it would be misconstrued as like, yep, you know, those folks down south, they still got those problems, but looks like the Supreme Court's going to handle that. Um, and so the decision was made to not have one of the quintessential deep southern um, state cases lead uh, in the naming of, of the case that they would bring so that the entire country um, would be asked to, to take a look. Uh, and to grapple with it. And so it's, it's, little, it's little things like that. It's not a little thing, big thing uh, like that, that we can uh, do uh, in our space. And so much of this ties to, uh, to South Carolina, but we are talking about our national and our international stories there. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. And of course, here in Virginia, the case uh, was the most well-known case was the case of Barbara Johns. Um, mm -hmm. That was in Prince Edward <laughs> County. And that was one of the cases that was folded into that huge case. And, and you're right, they're good, Marshall, that whole team. Um, you know, they, they give me goosebumps when I think about yeah. those lawyers and what they did and how strategic they were and how intentional they were and how intelligent they were. They give me yeah. goosebumps. They, they sincerely do. We are talking, if you just joined us, you have missed so much. But like I said, you can go back to the website and check it out. But we are talking to Dr. Tanya Matthews, and she is the C president and CEO 
of this brand new museum, and it is being built right now in Charleston, South Carolina. I need you all to get your tickets. It is called the International African American Museum. It will open in January of 2023. And so what is the um, what is the vibe right there in Charleston about this museum? You know, the vibe uh, about the museum is is very, very good. You know, um, Charleston is uh, is a place that welcomes visitors, right? We have totally embraced our place in the in the tourism lexicon. Um, you know, I was uh, immediately coming out of Detroit. Let me tell you all something. It is 75 degrees in February <laughs> down here. Like I had to, nice. I had to adjust. <laughs> To readjust, uh, and so you know, so we're we're a community that uh, embraces visitors, right? So we're prepared for visiting, um, but I also think that we're also a community that is known for our food and for our culture. And one of the things that Charleston, we're in the, the area of the state we refer to as the Low Country, um, is finally sort of you know taking pride in and coming to grips with is that a lot of, of what we consider this low country culture and cuisine is African African American. Um, we are the we are the Lord did we bring some okra? We are the ones <laughs> that brought the brought the okra. Yes. We are the ones that that brought with us the secret um, to to growing and to cultivating rice. Carolina Gold is our rice, which we're so uh, well known for. Um, even when we think about some of the, the licks that we're most familiar with in jazz and the syncopation rhythms, um, and it's funny. I will walk into some places. I went to some first Sunday services uh, recently. Folks are so proud of me because I could do the Charleston clap. You know? Oh wow! So it's, okay. It's, 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 Mm-hmm. But it's the classic syncopated clap that black folks do. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, oh, that's a Charleston thing? You know, we do that all over. Like, all that's, over. That's, just, that's just how you get there when you're in church. Even, I'm Catholic, and even I know how to do the clap. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so, so as we're, we're thinking through through those things, and so, you know, the museum is being welcomed as an, as an epicenter, as a way to, to answer some of those questions, to encourage folks to explore more. And what I'm also hoping is that we also become kind of a launching ground for all of the other African-American heritage and historical sites that are also here um, in Charleston. We've got a partnership. Um, with uh, the the reimagination of the South Carolina Green Book, I remember the Green Book, yes, right? That yes. used to be the book that that uh, brothers and sisters okay. needed in order to navigate the South, mm-hmm. and they've reimagined it as an encyclopedia of all of the African American heritage sites across the state of South Carolina. So inside the museum, we've got this giant digital touch table and you can go up to this table and you can scroll around and figure out other places uh, in the community across the state uh, that you'd uh, that you'd like to visit. We've uh, designed that in partnership with, with Google. And so, you know, it's things like that. I think that folks are very excited about to share. Um, we are also we're right here on the waterfront. Um, and so we're looking forward to being able to program our some some storytelling, a lot, a lot of storytelling, um, African, African-American folk tales, a Gullah Geechee storytelling. Um, the Low Country Charleston is one of the, uh, the, um, the epicenters of the Gullah community. For those who are like, yeah, I've heard of that. Exactly. What is that? The Gullah Geechee uh, mm-hmm. people are um, the community of African-Americans who have maintained really strong, strong ties. cultural yes. ties to um, our African origins. You can, you can taste it in the food, you can hear it in the accent, you can sort of catch snippets of it in the Gullah uh, language. It's really remarkable. Um, and so all of that, these are all things that Charleston is, is known for. So I think that when it comes to our tourism community and our majority community, they are, they are looking forward um, to having a, a place where folks can have those, those resources and, and have those questions answered. For our African American community, um, we are looking forward to, dare I say, getting a little credit. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Sort of in, in terms of in terms of that, you know, culture is is a gift, right? And I was taught young, some sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way, that once you give a gift, you have no control over how it is used. That's right. That's right. So, so be. So be intentional in the giving, right? The only power you have is being intentional in the giving. And so um, having a museum like this helps us to be more intentional in the giving of the gifts 
of, of African, African American and Gullah Geechee culture. You know, as we've got the basket weaving and whoo Lord, you ain't never had shrimp and grits. Now listen, my mother's people are from New Orleans and, and sometimes I have to have a little competition. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to, we're going to have to think about this. I, I don't, I don't know who's, who's going to get the shrimp and grits award. Um, and apparently there's peach wars going on too. Don't tell. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, did I didn't not, know that. I did not. I didn't know sort of these kinds of things. So, so all of all of this in this place, and so you know, you know, talking about the the African American contributions um, to to that culture, um, but also even for for the African American community, giving us insight into the even the roots of that, right? You know, where where we we got that from, what we morphed it from, uh, in addition to uh, just the stories that that we'll tell. Well, we are running out of time. We have about. Five minutes, but I have a couple okay. of things I want to ask you. Um, yes. So how many, how long will I be able to go through this museum in one day? Oh, my. That no, is a really look, good I already question. know the answer is no. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, can, you can get through it, and I think you'll end up making notes about which part you really want to spend more time in when you come back. Um, we've got our interior museum space. It's got um, uh, eight galleries plus a traveling gallery, and then we also have our ex- Exterior, our African Ancestors Memorial Garden uh, that's outside that has art installations and additional interpretation as well. So between those two things, eh, maybe a day and a half or so. Day and a half. We know yeah. how well the National Museum of African American History and Culture yes. has been received in Washington, D.C. I mm-hmm. think that you would probably expect that you're going to get the same. And will you have that timed entry? I don't know if I'm saying it right, but the timed yes. entry is, from, is that what's going to happen? Yes, we are definitely expecting uh, that kind of, of interest. And uh, Dr. Lonnie Blunt has been a big supporter, oh, advocate, and advisor um, to us as we as we step into this space. And so there's there, there's a lot to be learned there. So we are expecting a uh, timed uh, ticketing. Um, and also very similarly, we have a charter membership program, uh, which is, is still open. Um, we'll be sort of wrapping up charter membership soon because charter membership is a special designation we give to those who became members before we were even able to open our doors. We got to thank all the believers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right. you can go on over to our website um, and then check that out and sign that up because you know, as we're thinking about time ticketing and entry, it'll be also be similar in that our charter members uh, will have, you know, first uh, and initial access uh, in terms of sort of getting in and, and getting into into that space as well. Well, that makes sense. And that website is iaamuseum.org? Yes, it is. iaamuseum.org. And I would say to all the, the young folks and the students and perhaps the grandparents that are looking for interesting gifts to give, our memberships do actually start at $25. Um, one of the things, we're, and it goes all the way up to, you know, to 1000 5000 but one of the things we want to prioritize is accessibility. Um, there are going to be a lot of barriers, perhaps you know, um, to, to come to a place like this to learn and, and sit and have these conversations. But we really do not want finances to be one of them. Uh, that's, that's one of, I think, one of the, the easiest things. We can knock that off and, and get to the, the tough stuff. I am speaking the final minutes with Dr. Tanya Matthews. She's the president and CEO of this new museum and is opening the weekend of January 21st, 2023? Yes. Okay. Yes, that is the weekend after uh, MLK weekend. Yes, 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 yes. I think that's a great birthday present for myself. That's my birthday month. And so <laughs> I'm okay. sitting here listening to you, and I'm like, Dr. Tanya says if I'm a charter member that I can make sure I can get in there. But yes. in all seriousness, we need you all to look up your tickets, see if maybe you're close enough to drive if you're listening, wherever you're listening, buy your tickets. Please support this museum, love on this museum, because it didn't have to happen. And I'm just thinking about that mayor 20-some years ago, this white mayor coming up with this mm-hmm. idea, and I'm like, mm-hmm. wow, that mm-hmm. is incredible. So speaking yeah. of incredible, Dr. Tanya Matthews, you are incredible. Thank you so oh. much for joining <laughs> us today. I appreciate your vision, and I appreciate your leadership, and you are welcome on Thank these you. airways anytime, young lady. 
Well, if that's the case, I shall be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> that's it. And when I come, I'm going to leave you a message. I'm not going to look for your audience because I know you'll be busy, but I am going to leave you a message because I plan on coming. Oh, you better not show up, and then I get a message after the fact. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, that's that's not that's not you the way. You changed this your whole tone. Okay, I received that. Okay, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, you all. Thank you for joining me on the line today. We have had a wonderful Saturday afternoon again today. Don't forget the International African American Museum. It's being built in Charleston, South Carolina. It's going to open in early 2023. Be there. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. I love you all. You take care. Bye bye. 